when they start giving out Oscars for being a guest on a podcast, then this guy is going to be the first one to pick one up. The person that we've got on for this episode, well, for the next two episodes, Mark Schofield, is somebody who really does inspire. He is somebody that if you know him, you might not have seen as much of him lately, because as you're shortly to find out, he's been a very busy guy over the last couple of years. Uh, I've known Mark, Rob's known Mark, we've both known him for a very long time. And uh, it's been an absolute honour to be able to walk him through his life and world according to Scofe and to be able to hear him at his finest and to be able to find out things about him that we didn't know and to just hear things that we did know again and to be able to share it with people. Um, it can be quite challenging to listen to some of the things that have happened in Mark's life and also pretty exciting and inspiring to hear about how he's dealt with things and the achievements that he's put together and just his general character and the energy that he brings into things. A chat with Scofe is something that should never be done in a hurry, which is why we've been happy to cut this one in half so that you can have a week to think about what you've heard in between. So let's get on with the first bit of it. And so we're going to hear about Scofe's life uh, up to the point where his surfing career is going very well. Uh, we will hear about some of the challenges because it, it's a surfing career that was challenging from the beginning. Um, and then next week we can hear a little bit more about sort of bringing Mark up to the to the 2010s and 2020s. is easily overused in surfing but today perhaps more than any episode thus far it is surely apt we're joined in the socially distanced garden studio by one of my favorite humans mark schofield scope is here to talk surfing health golf everything in between expect meticulously thought out theories pointed analysis and tales of plenty from a time of welsh dominance in british surfing welcome mark to crest or should i say uh, thank you for having us in uh, your very nice, socially distanced garden studio. It's an absolute pleasure, boys, and I'm really happy to have you here. Thank you very much. And we'll, of course, uh, be hearing much, much more from you shortly. But first, as is tradition, it's time for me to introduce my co-host. To my right, and looking like he needs a good bath, is a man who has just returned from a week-long survival course. The programme, named Bushcraft for Beginners, aims to take smooth-handed, pen-pushing city dwellers and turn them into self-sufficient survivalists through a series of brutal challenges, the safety and ethics of which have been called into question on more than one occasion. But he's still alive. It's Tom Anderson. How are you, Tom? As you said, still alive, still breathing, which, I, which I've been told helps. Yet, to my left, it's the man whose imitation trip, based on the tale of his literary hero, was short-lived. His attempt to recreate on Newport's River Isca the famous Congolese boat journey used by Joseph Conrad to inspire Heart of Darkness and later the movie Apocalypse Now was stopped in its tracks when the first outpost he encountered was serving pims and volavants, prompting him to stay the week. It's Robert Webster Blythe. Better than normal from you. Oh, thank... Well, you, you, see, this is where you first come in now, Scope, right? Because this is a weekly competition that we do, right? Over making up each other's intros. They're obviously completely true, but it's just, it's just to do with who's managed to find the best little known fact about each other. Rob actually currently leads me 3-1 for some reason, but I was hoping that you might give me the nod as the best one this week. What do you reckon? Yeah, I think I'll go with you then. Oh, well done. There. Three, two. Well, Coming said. for you. Okay. That would have been a big that would have been a big swing the other way at four one. It would have been the Hard there we go back. coming back, yeah. There we are. Well now in a, a slightly more serious tone, it's your turn, Mark. Dear listeners, uh, you heard in the intro that today's guest will be talking surf, health, golf and everything in between. A curious mix, you might think, but not for Mark Schofield. Yes, Mark has scaled the heights of Welsh, British and even European surfing. But the highs are balanced by what many, what for many would be crushing lows. He has suffered severe life-changing and indeed life-threatening setbacks in the form of chronic illness. But this is a man who's also stood out in cutthroat lineups while still plugged into a dialysis machine nightly. A man who has smiled at his luck or lack of it and taken his lot on the chin. Where surfing couldn't be the tonic, 
He is also found in golf, a sport that allows him to channel his uncanny ability to be competitive with anyone and everyone, including himself. The buzz Scofe derives from seeing the rewards of commitment are matched by his capacity for intricate, meticulous analysis and met methodological improvement. <coughs> Surfing, golf, poker, the guitar, the stock market, talking, you're not quite as good as me, Scofe. Uh, each becomes a metaphor for each, with the mother superior wave riding the driving force behind it all. Once again, thank you for inviting us into your garden studio for once, uh, for what is a very socially distanced broadcast. And uh, it is socially distanced for very good reason, because, of course, we're, we're absolutely looking to sort of keep you out of the way of uh, the, the current health crisis at all costs, really, aren't we? Uh, you are, boys, and thank you very much for that intro, which is a little bit over the top. No. I don't know whether I'm uh, all of those <laughs> things, but thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, and, and I was just talking about the, the lengths that producer Dodd has gone to uh, in the garden today. We basically brought the whole of the Crest Garden Studio here, and it's fabulous. It's a lovely informal setup. We've got a bit of an audience. Uh, Scope's son, George, is sitting over there. Um, we've, we've got the dog, Bella, who might occasionally have to be sort of shouted at. She just ate some of my cheese and biscuits before we started. Uh, Jane is here and a couple of others. There's even a hot tub that some of the guests who, who are watching are going to be jumping into in a little bit. Um, and... Uh, yeah, we, we, you know, it's it's just, it's all been done to make sure that that you know this 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 precious body of yours is sort of you know gonna 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 live to fight many more days, and I suppose that is that is something you're you're used to doing, isn't it? This idea of sort of you know that, yeah, that it's you've, that you've done all this, so I'm relaxed and not nervous. That's what it is, isn't it? <laughs> I get scared in front of you guys. Yeah, sad. yeah. No, it is important for me to stay safe. I I, I have sort of been hibernating it in the house. Yeah. Luckily, with my wife. Well, for the past, uh, I think it's nearly six months now. It's a while. You're looking and yeah, sounding yeah. good, though, Scope. It's great to see you. Actually, I think the reason why we're going to all these lengths is because you've actually just come out of a period of radiotherapy, having had cancer through the COVID crisis. I have, yeah. I was, um, I, I was pretty, pretty unlucky, really, that uh, I ended up with cancer at the very start of the COVID crisis, which was... Um, even from my standards, it was a little bit scary, to be quite honest with you, when, uh, uh, unfortunately, what happened is I came back off holiday uh, in from Tenerife. We were actually the last flight to leave Tenerife. The plane actually came over empty, took us back home. And uh, on at the following week, I actually go in to have my operation, which was literally when the hospitals were shutting down and the whole thing was just going nuts. So it was a pretty scary time when... I was all booked in, I was all ready to go down and uh, the surgeon came along and he had a real straight face remembering I was literally on my own, there was no, there was no guests in there at all, well no visitors, can't say guests, there was no visitors <laughs> in there and um, the only thing I, I was, I was talking to George, Jessica and uh, George, Jessica and Jane on the phone and the surgeon came in and he basically said look if we carry on with this operation you've got to sign to say that you won't use a ventilator because you are volunteering for this operation. Wow. So... And this is, obviously, we rewind to this long ago, we knew very little. Uh, we knew very... Well, that's why the Didn't hospitals, we? they basically were shutting, shutting the hospitals down and they believed that if you caught it, you would go... You, you, you would literally be on a ventilator and I had to turn around and say, look, I won't have a ventilator. Chances. So, you know, fortunately... Um, I did go ahead, we all made a decision and I did go ahead and I think it was the right thing to do to be quite honest with you as, as this whole thing turned out they sliced my neck out and put the tubes in but I was literally in hospital for uh, I had to have a neck dissection and I went in on the Monday had the operation Monday afternoon and came home at Tuesday at six o'clock, Jane picked me up from outside. And, the and then became the became, began the fourteen day wait to hope that you hadn't caught. And the then, virus well, one the virus was was the big one, and secondly, I had to wait to see what this cancer was and whether it was was whether I needed radiotherapy. Unfortunately, I also needed radiotherapy. So my next bit of it was I had to then go to sort the radiotherapy out in that period of time. So then I went into Valindra, which you can imagine Valindra in the height of uh, the height of the coronavirus episode when nobody knew anything about it. 
it was pretty serious again. I had to go in on my own, and I remember sitting in this quite small room with uh, one of the consultants. She was all masked up, you couldn't see her face. I'm all masked up, and she basically said, she said it in a nice way, but basically she said, look, you either stick with the cancer and, and hope it doesn't come back, or you go for the treatment. But if you do have the treatment, where you are having the treatment on your throat and your mouth, you will probably die if you catch the coronavirus. So your choice is cancer or coronavirus. Again, we're fortunate now we've got mobile phones and stuff. That was done with Jane and George and Jess made the decision and we made the decision and now to go. go for it. Wow. And I must say it was, um, you know, the experience was pretty, you know, I wouldn't like to have done it the first time round. For me, this was a second time round, which made it... Yeah, because you had cancer before. Yeah, yeah. I, I had it before. I had it on the other side of my, my neck. And that time was a really rough ride on on it. So I was expecting to be really bad. But wow. this time, I, I, I sort of... I got through it as well as I possibly could, to be honest. So, uh, no. It was, uh, it was something that I wouldn't like to experience again. And I wouldn't like other people to do it. Because it's a lot of stuff. I mean, when you think about it... I mean, people, people are worried about the virus. You sit there and you think, when did you ever think people would decide cancer was a better bet yeah. than coronavirus? You wouldn't think anything could be worse than cancer, would you? Yeah. And at that point, it is getting better and people do know more about it. But remember, I was literally, we're talking... Right at the beginning. We're talking um, uh, March the 16th. Which yeah. is bang on yeah. That's when, yeah, when, all the, schools when the world was going. Yeah. yeah, well, the schools are shut in, and we're meant to be going in there. And, and some of the schools were shut in. They were saying it might be for a week. It might be for two months. You know, Correct, so, yeah. so no well, one knew what was happening. No, yeah. it was it was a it was a scary time. It was scary. Go. I mean, in fairness, the only good thing is the roads are all clear to drive in there and stuff. It was <laughs> it was a nice run in. <laughs> this uh, this of course um, well, it wasn't the first time that you'd had a run in with serious illness, as we we mentioned. Um, your first came when it could be said that you were at the, the top of your game surfing-wise and at the tender age of 21. And I'd like to focus on that early period in your surfing, uh, first of all. Oh, so, yeah, let's talk about surfing. Yeah, where did it all yeah. begin for you, Scope? Yeah. Um, my, my, my recollection of first deciding to go surfing was we used to skateboard. Uh, there was uh, Terry Davies, Bobby Phillips and a couple of the others, Andy Price and stuff, we all used to skateboard quite a bit. And they used to have a glide, a thing called, it used to be called a glider fibre ramp down in Cozy Corner there, and there was a ramp there. And one day we went up and we went into what used to be the swimming pools on the seafront. Do you remember the, the concrete pool swimming pools? Yeah, the, the rock pools, pools they called them, didn't they? Yeah. yeah, and the bigger one had a, had sort of like a, a, a what was it, it was a scaffolding fence on it that was falling out of it they're pretty dangerous things really but and you could stand there and you could look over the sea and then you'd wait for the waves to break and stuff like that and one day there was someone actually surfing at low tide uh low tide esp and the two of us or three of us that were there decided we'd go surfing so it was bobby phillips terry davis and myself that's how i recall it someone could recall it differently but as far as i can say i recall that and that's the moment that surfing was we were going to give surfing a go i remember it was either um bobby's brother had a surfboard he was older than us and he had a surfboard in the garage of course, the boards were quite hard and to come by back then they were hard to come by yeah god back there it was it was they were ten a penny like that they weren't all over the shop and i can remember um, I did, you know, I'm looking back now, I can't remember my very... I can't remember whether I had a board, first of all, that I surfed on, or whether I... I always remember my very first board was bought from um, your dad's shop, or used to be your dad's shop, Rob. Uh, what was it called? I, don't, I honestly don't know. I have to find that one out. Because I know Fluff had it, didn't he? And then Sharky yeah. had it. There was Fluff. I think, I think was it called it was Fluff? Fluff, and then my dad went in with him. And yeah. then I think... My dad carried it on, and then they sold it to Sharky, or he sold it to Sharky. That's it. I can remember I saw my first pair of board shorts in there. I can't remember the brand, but I'll they, find out the they, name for you. They, were, they had their board shorts in in like the middle rack, and 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 they were there. Anyway, the board that I ended up getting was a board called um, uh, uh, it was called the Flying Fish. 
it was a white board and it was a single wing swallowtail and that's the board that I very first started surfing on and I believe it was a single fin I believe it was a single fin and that's the time that, that, that I remember I also remember my first my first waves as in surfing the green waves rest bay tied halfway in caught um, caught a broken wave and then it reformed and I remember the sensation of it going from you know when you ride the foam it's quite hard to ride the foam even for a good surfer you know and it's because it's the, the movement yeah, you, don't and control, you, do you? you don't have any control but as soon as you get any little you know the green wave the surfing it goes smooth it's just you sort of you're there and I can remember that feeling of, uh, of going and I was actually probably the last one of the bunch to to actually ride the green wave as they would say I, I was pretty I, 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 I was a pretty slow star really so by uh, the word bunch I'm assuming that you're referring to Brad Hockridge and Simon Tucker. no 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 I can tell you a real good story about that I can remember watching Brad when I was in there there was there was Bobby Phillips, Terry Davis, and myself were the main ones at Sir. That's where we used to change in Bobby's house, which is on Seven Road by the school. He was his was the closest house. We used to walk down and we used to mainly surf the cove. We used to go down the rocks and surf the cove. People don't surf it as much now, do they? It's like a wander down. But that's what we did. It was popular during lockdown. Uh, was it? Yeah, it couldn't be. Because he was out of the way, <laughs> I think. Yeah, that's where we surfed because it was the closest one down the rocks. But no, I can remember watching, there were two people, but I remember Brad vividly, and I've told him this, so I remember watching Brad catch a wave, and he got down from the wave, he got down from the wave, onto his belly, and belly boarded in and got out, and I thought it was like insane how good he was. Really? I thought it was just amazing, because I'm like wallowing around inside, and he's there uh, being able to surf. But it wasn't long that you carried on thinking that of him though because your your learning curve was pretty steep and I think this is one of the things I find very interesting about you is that you've always sort of looked at activities from the point of view of how do I quickly reach that kind of the upper echelon yeah. where something can be done and, and what, what, how long was it? was it? It was about a year before you were... It was national. around about that, it was pretty pretty much it was quick, I'm saying a year probably a year, year and a half-ish and then you were I, a national. I champion. didn't. I didn't go out to be the best surfer. Right. I just loved to surf. You know, I I, I would stay in, in in the water from high to low. You know, I would literally be in but there from low you tide were to, to high beat tide. When you won that uh, nationals that first. No, nah, I. It, it was just. Do you know, back in the day, it wasn't quite as intense as it is now, and it was the the Welsh was an incredibly good weekend it was a weekend that people went to everybody went to even if you didn't enter you went down there you sat on the, the bits i mean rob you caught the tail end of it when your dad would go down he'd be down there he knows your mum and dad know exactly what i'm talking about it was it was big the car parks and stuff were full of people in campers and camping there and and it was just an event i went down for the weekend to surf and I entered a competition. I didn't know I was going to... Didn't even know I had a chance at sort of winning it. You know, there, there was a... I can't even remember the boys in it. I remember the boys in the final, and I don't know... Now, Brad and Simon could tell you a totally different story of this, but I don't remember them. They must have been there, but I don't remember them. I remember the final being Frenchy, great surfer then. Chris French. And, and the Browns. I think one of the Browns were in it, which they were really good surfers. They were really good surfers, and I can't remember the other ones, but I re I, I remember that. And but you remember Chris O'Connor? Yeah, well, Chris, you. Chris Chris used to take us down there, and probably it it sounds as if it was a bit harsh, really, but but it was, and I didn't take it as being harsh, and it was something probably that stuck with me as well for 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 always, to be honest. I can remember jumping in the van after I'd won, and, and, and that, those days they had a proper ceremony. Uh, they still do, but it was like a proper ceremony. Yeah, you would, everybody would, hang you would, to everybody watch it, would yeah. be hanging around. It would be a big thing, and, and, and to hold one of those trophies was like really good. And I, and I remember going up and, and I, well, funny enough, I don't remember going and getting. I remember going in the van with it and thinking, oh, my mum and dad are going to be stoked, like. And he turned round to me, and Chris, Chris, Chris looked at me, go. You done really well, you have, but you weren't the best surfer. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I, I just thought, uh, and at that point, it made me think that he didn't dishearten me. What he made me do is I had to go back to be the best surfer. I always felt that by me achieving something made me have to do a little better because people will say that to you. So I was more concerned, probably wrongly, I don't know, that people wouldn't think I was worthy of it. Now, some people don't care. They just think, oh, I've won, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, as you say, we, ca we caught the best three ways and we won. I would want to be the best guy that won. It wouldn't be, oh, you did well because you won so the I think that speaks ways. volumes about your character, and it's something that we hopefully will talk a little bit more about later. But you, um, there are a few names in there um, in the form of Brad Hockridge and Simon Tucker, and you mentioned Chris French as well. Yeah. And adding to that list, the likes of Carwin Williams, and I'm sure there are many others yeah. that you would have, you know, we did come to know, as, yeah, yeah. as friends and rivals mm. and as, like I said I imagine there's an incredible amount of rivalry and subsequently perhaps motivation for you to improve and to uh, to get one over on them was that the case? Yeah I, I think I think it started to when when obviously if, if I, I won the worst then someone else I mean it's like it, it's really nice if someone does really well because then it motivates you mm -hmm. you surf with that person that does well and so you, you think you think you can do well I mean there was a little bit but we all surfed together yeah. you, you know we, we did all surf together I can't remember it being uh, overly that period when overly the juniors that way. must have been in quite an I don't know, an intense experience because you're all such fantastic surfers. Yeah, I, I think, I think though that period of time when the Welsh were dominating, um, and and I mean we did to be honest with you. I mean there's not many times you can say that if you won your club championship, you'd think you could win the Welsh, mm -hmm. because the people in it were so good that it wasn't a case that you could you could just go, oh, you know, it was easy round. It wasn't. There, there were just good people ever. Even people that didn't do, that aren't, that I'm, that aren't known to be good were good surfers. It was me, it just yeah. they didn't do, they didn't do the right things at the time. But even the ones that were, 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 were slightly below that were, were still great surfers, you know. And uh, you also had, I think, the kind of older guys in the club sort of keeping you in check and... Pushing yeah, you, and you, you mentioned a couple of the older guys that looked out for you and gave you bits of advice. You mentioned Jeff Davis for one. Jeff was always, I always remember Jeff encouraging me, and uh, you know, he, he, he also would say if he was surfing well and stuff like that. He may have done it to all of the other ones, he, he, he may have done it to Brad, Sign, you know, you, you name it, the, the ones in there. But yeah, he always, I always felt that he encouraged me, especially Jeff did, and uh, yeah, and. and your dad did, funny enough. Your, your dad gave me really good advice when uh, I can remember surfing in, in one event. And he, he, he really... It's, it's funny how you can take advice good or you can take it bad. And uh, he sort of... His, his very words were, when I, when I came out the sea, it was almost like, you can do that really well, which is basically I was going to the bottom and then I was going to the top and I was going to the bottom and I'd go to the top. And if I got it right, I'd be doing re-entries and stuff down the line. And he sort of said to me, he goes, you've got that wired. You need to vary it a bit. You need to do a cutback or you need to do, you need to do something. And it really hit a point with me that I did actually think, do you know, I am sort of getting a bit monotonous here. And that sort of improved my repertoire, you know. It was like as if I'm not just going to do those, you know, hit, hit those, try and hit the lips all the time. But i tell you one thing I think why the Welsh were really good at that period of time was... There was a lot of things came together for us. And one of those things was board design. And I think when the twin fins were were big and they were they were big tailed, the twin fins came in rather than single fins. We had some of them uh, some of us had a little fin in the back. They were perfect boards for our waves. They were perfect. But everybody was using those same boards. But they worked on our waves. Yeah. Are you with me? It was like as if it was our waves. If you took them to France, they'd be rubbish. But our waves, they were good. And you've got, you had Carwin, you had uh, loads of the boys down there. Cat was another one. All of those, they could surf. Everybody was surfing so well that, you know, like the British team was made up of Welsh people. I mean, how, yeah. how is that? Yeah. But I believe it was the boards were the right. And everybody else was surfing the wrong board for their ways, and we were on the right one. So for a period of time, 
we sort of made hay with it. And, so Rest Bay and, was like the kind of equivalent to, to, to trestles. <laughs> yeah, no, Rest Bay, the, the boards worked. They allowed us to get to the flat sections. They allowed us to do it. We went really fast. Are you with me? We, we were like a little skate park. Whereas mm. what then happened is whether the Aussies turned up into town or whoever turned up, and they made the boards thinner and they were harder to surf. What I mean by that, harder work to surf. They were just hard work. You had to be, you know, the moment you get up, you got to go for it. Whereas with the bigger boards, you could catch them a little bit earlier, the waves a bit earlier. Growing up in Porthcall, going to school, I remember one of the great injustices we always had was that surfing was never on the honours board, you know? Never. Uh, only Paul Lovell got on the honours board for being the Argo Young sports person. Is that what he got, was he? Yeah, they didn't put the sport next to it because the school was down on surfing. It it. it 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 had a bad image. Um, and I remember in in meetings that that uh, surfers had with the head teacher of the time, trying to. I remember them drawing, and, and this was one of the first times I sort of really heard, heard of you, uh, or knew knew of your your CV at that point. Is, is it was like, look, there's a European champion in this town. Yeah. And it was you. I, did, did you remember that? Well, they didn't time? really. I got to be honest. They never really gave us. I, I don't know whether it was because we didn't particularly want it. Because we weren't, surfers weren't, like surfers now blend into to everybody around now, but at the time we were, we used to go to school with our hair wet and just still <laughs> like putting clothes on that is damp. And, but you were a and, European and just, champion. Just running it. Yeah, but it didn't, you know, it, 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 it only, it only titles, meant stuff, titles, it only yeah. meant that to us, didn't it? It didn't yeah. mean anything to, to them. You know, from our point of view, it was the fact that in the chemistry lab, you could look out and see the surf, and if it was good, you'd get the hell out of there if you can. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing about it was, and you couldn't do it now, we had, like, a little skate routes that we knew we could go along the side of that one, go there, pop around the corner there, and you could hop out without anybody seeing you. And Brad and Simon, they're in the same year group as you? They they were a year less than us. They were a year below. So then, so you had the, you know this rivalry Rob was asking you about, and uh, one of those memories that you've got there is when you all travelled up to Brim's Nest together, and that was a European championship. Well, we travelled with, uh, a lot of the time it was with Brad, rather than Simon, but yeah, we went up to, well, it wasn't Brim's Nest, funny enough, that was for the European juniors. Right. And Brad was, a, was is still a really good surfer, and he was a good surfer then, really good. And we were drawn, unfortunately, at that point in the semi-finals, and we were sharing a room as well in the same hotel. I, I mean... I can't say, again, it didn't feel as if we were hugely competitive because these things didn't... The reward wasn't as great as people think they would be. The reward was your reward. Mm. Do, 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 do you get what I mean? I didn't suddenly get, I didn't it? suddenly get a deal and, and, and I've got... My life is sorted and, and I've done, which would have been beautiful if I'd won the European Golf Championship. I would have been sorted for life, but it wasn't like that. And, you know, that at that contest... We both knew whoever won this semi-final would go on to win the final because we were both, well, we felt we were both the, the better ones to it. So, you know, if, if he had beaten me, which he could have as easy as I beat him without a shadow of a doubt, then... Um, He'd have been a European he, champion. He would have been European champion and, and off he goes. But Brad was always, he, Brad was the most consistent, I think, out of all of us, for sure. There were lots... <laughs> Lots more event titles to boot, and as we've learned, you weren't someone to rest on your laurels, even to the point of not feeling that you deserved something until you repeated the feat. But do any of your, your victories really stand out in your mind as being uh, something you felt particularly proud of? Uh, I think there's a, there's well, a story about I, quite big Thurso, isn't there? Thurso was always a nice one because it was good stuff, but uh, the, ones, the, the ones I sort of remember, I, I, I remember... Jersey, because it was good waves. Uh, funny enough, it was good waves, and it was on more of a left, okay. And I was surfing against Paul Russell, and because it was a left, it was that that to me to do well against Paul Russell because Paul Russell was a great surfer. But in the final, though... And Paul Russell's now an uh, oceanographer, isn't he? Is he? he? The, yeah, I, I really... I, I, don't know, I don't know much. But Paul yeah. Russell was, uh, was... We always remember him. He lived in Leicester. And uh, he used to travel around with his parents all the time. But he was a... Uh, 
he was a bit of you don't follow golf do you but he was a bit of a bright side but it always felt to me he was a bit of a scientist of surfing you know he knew what to do when to do it at the right time wasn't particularly great but he did the job really well but he, he was always but he's a really nice guy poor, poor was but the one that actually that I would say something that that always made me enjoy and still does to this day enjoy competing or, or a certain amount of it was I was in the final of the British and I believe it was Colin Wilson and the two Colin Wilson Chris Gard and myself I know those two were in it and I went down the beach and I was quite young then because I had to surf I think I had to surf in that because I was old for my age and I had to go in the seniors but I theoretically could have still been a junior, something yeah, like that. Yeah, people in your school year group would have still yeah, been a junior. Yeah, but I had yeah. to, I had to flip over because they wouldn't let me go as yeah. a junior. So I could still surf in the juniors, but didn't matter what I did, I couldn't go on any, you know, British trips or anything as a junior. And I was really nervous going down there. And Colin turned to me and goes, "What's the matter with you?" And I said, "Oh, I'm pretty shit myself, aren't I? I'm, 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 I'm scared. I'm nervous." He goes, "What are you nervous for?" I said, "Well, look, we're in the final, and we, it's the main one." He goes, "Nah." The main one is all the ones you've got. You've got a prawly effort to get here. <laughs> now, you enjoy it. You've done it. You just go out there and have a surf. And, you know, it was almost like as if you'd pulled the plug on me. It was like, you know, he's bloody right here. All I do is go. And when I play golf, and I was competitive, which I'm not now, by the way, when I was competitive, all I wanted to do was get to the 18th hole. If I could get to the 18th hole, it didn't matter whether I won or lost. I had to get to the 18th hole. So I stood on the 18th tee, and as long as I got there, I think I'd made it. Look, I'd made the complete All the course. big holes are behind you. Well, I just made the course, haven't I? Yeah. You know, I'm playing against somebody, and I've actually made the course. It's not like it's I've like been, journey. been beaten Making at the, the end. end. And then I relax then, so the 18th hole is the one you want to win on, isn't it? You, yeah. you, you, you like, pull the plug on the guy, if you can. And you, were, you also were about to tell us a story about Paul Russell before I so rudely interrupted you as well. You were in a final against him? I, that was that final. Yeah, it was, oh, that, it was final. that final. I think it right. was that final. I'm sure he was there. Right. I'm sure, anyway, the ways are really good. And one of the judges, I tell you who it was, was Nigel Sermons. And he, he was a great surfer. And, and Christ, these guys won't remember this, but I, I remember him and I always thought that if I could win and him judging me, that, that, that was a good, a good omen. Yeah, great. Yeah, it was when it was sponsored by cigarette people, that was. Drank to that, yeah. Well, not that now, it was a big you? deal, yeah. Was it what was it, uh, uh James, American well, tobacco or yeah, something, something like that? Yeah, 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 it was a yeah, tobacco Goldleaf. company that sponsored it. So, we had a nice trophy with that as well. My dad has also actually told me the story that you were telling just then about yeah. what he said to you, and and he likes to try and take credit for an event in which he thinks you won by doing a my dad describes it as a carve in 360, but I know you talk it down a little bit more modestly, don't you? It, but there it, was this event. Was it? Was it the Nuki Classic? I think it was the Nuki the... Classic. Yeah, it was the Nuki Classic when it was originally the Nuki Classic, where it was like British people in it. It wasn't. Yeah. It got like a bit bigger, and it, then it, it turned up into what it did. But it was one of the first Nuki Classics, and the surf was quite big. Yeah, and. Uh, he, he's taking credit for that A360. Uh, sorry, well, A360. Sorry, I'm three decades earlier. 360. Are hey, you like, pushing me? <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I do now. 360. So you said, you know, but you, but you, you did this 360 on a decent size wave, a bottom turn. Yeah, uh, it, it won the car 360. It was because the wave was so big, because it was quite big that day. Uh, the surf was quite big. When I did the 360, it, it. As it moved round and I was sliding the tail, because that's the way we sort of did them, it sort of made it feel like it was it was a car because it was so... Because I can remember them coming out of the beach and saying, oh, you did a car 360. And I remember thinking, I don't remember doing that. <laughs> Maybe they'd mark somebody else. But this interview uh, is going to have these high highs and then we're going to go... Low lows. To the low lows. And it, it was in that same event, the Nuki Classic, when you first started to realise that you had something very seriously wrong with your It was a, an event in Newquay, and we stayed in. The, I went down with the guys. Who were the guys? I can't remember the guys now. I'm trying to think. Anyway, I can remember staying in the Lynx. It's still there, isn't it? The Lynx Hotel in Newquay? On, on that headland? It is, the headland hotel. it's still there. Yeah. We stayed in there, and uh, we stayed in there as well, didn't we, Jane? Anyway, with the, with, the, with the guys, and I can remember being in the event... And I got through my heat, and I remember being so tired, so physically tired, that I thought, 
I'm not going back in there. I, it was just too knackered to go back in. And I sort of slammed the board in the back of the car and said, I'm not going back in again, boys. And they said, you got through, though. I said, I'm not going back in. And that was the last time I sort of... I, it wasn't the last time I served in an event, but it was the last time that I could with during that period where, where where I knew my kidneys were failing you know mm-hmm. where, where they'd sort of it had gone too far so from there presumably it was to the doctors to find out what was causing you to feel that way yeah it was yeah in the heat in Cardiff wasn't it love uh, we went to the heat in Cardiff and uh, I'm trying to think the consultant's name though no? Yeah, so we went there, and when when we went in, I didn't feel I didn't feel super bad, but I was bad enough that I couldn't compete. I mean, you'd be surprised how much effort it is to paddle around course, and, yeah. and, and adrenaline is in, in a heat. But I'd either played a bit of golf or gone surfing, and I'd gone in, and they took my blood, and they came back, and they said, "Jesus, this is off the charts. Like you need to dialyze today," and I said, "I can't today. I got stuff to do." <laughs> you know, and he said, "No, no, you, you've actually got to go on the machine as soon as possible." And I said, "Oh, I got stuff to do. I can do it Monday." And he said, "Right, you you need to come in Monday." And I went in Monday. Dialyze meaning because dialyze meaning. Well, first of all, what they did, they put a subclavia in my in my my neck, which is basically a tube that goes down into uh, an uh, I'm going to say a, a vein, no, an artery, just above the heart. And then they sew it to your shoulder where they'd plug the machine in to start with. They'd plug the machine in, and the that dialyzing machine. And kind of acts as, as and, a kidney. And that acts as a kidney, then it comes out. But when I had that done, I was so scared of needles and stuff. The doctor said to me, he goes, oh, it's an awful low, to you, didn't he, to Jane, to my wife. He said, you've an awful low pain threshold you have, haven't you? <laughs> and... Uh, because he was like three foot away, and I said, "Yeah, I can feel that. I can feel that." It's coming. It was one of those things that it was like it, 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 I just wasn't used to being prodded around, really. And that's when I went went on, and it was a bad time then. Dial, dialyzing was bad then. It was a real journey because they didn't uh, they didn't do certain things they do now, and you would get cramp like you wouldn't believe because they're basically taking salt and everything out of you. And it was just one of those things they just used to tell you to, well, they didn't really tell you to do anything, just, like, suck it up, like, and, and you could get serious stomach cramp and stuff. And you were on it minimum of eight hours. Wow. So it was three times a week, eight hours. And by the time you felt better, you had one day of feeling all right, and then you, then, then, then you were back on it. It was a, it was a ride. So hearing, hearing that news that you're going to have to dialyse, and I assume it was with the intention that it was going to be for the foreseeable future, Yeah, that must have been... A real, a real shock to the system in itself. Thinking of what an active lifestyle you kind of led up to that point, with surfing yeah. and golf and whatnot. It's funny when you, when you're younger, you, you. Well, I felt that I'd get through it. It wasn't quite as, as, as blind as that. My mother had already gone for tests to see that she could give a kidney, and she could. So the period of time that I was meant to be on dialysis was meant to be relatively short because it was her getting tested and they do. Anyway, doctors going on holidays and certain things happened. So I was on dialysis about two or three months, which is much longer than was meant to be. Mm-hmm. So I, there, there was an end to that because my mum was going to give me a kidney. Yeah. So it's always like the problem with things is if you have things there's no end to, you, you, can't, you, you can't like focus on stuff. So I was fortunate at that period of time to have a period where I could see that there was going to be an end to it, which was, uh, which was nice, which was good. Which, in the end, she did give me a kidney, and it was incredible when I actually had the kidney and got it. And fortunately, she's been really well from it. She's really well from it. Yeah. I mean, she's coming up to 80 now, so she's lived quite a long time with... Um, with the one? With just the one kidney, yeah. Yeah. Fighting yeah. fit. I saw, uh, yeah, I saw no, Jean she's... Schofield strolling down New Road the other day. She's she's really good. I don't think she suffered any uh, side effects from it at all, at all. You know, and and we're going back quite a long time now. What are we going back? We're going back. We're going back After at thirty years, at least thirty odd years. Yeah. And presumably, um, the kind of the transplant system and everything that goes with it has changed substantially in that that period of time. It's changed loads. Even the di- even dialysis has changed loads. There's it, it's it's improved leaps and bounds. Like you 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 can't believe. So you carried on 
surfing and travelling again then, you've got a second lease of life, you're back out there, you're surfing, but it was somewhere around now that you started to realise that you had the potential to be very, very good, as in we're talking no, the decimal no, no. point sub three at, at golf. Yeah, well, no, I never, I never thought I could be good at golf. To be honest, I played golf because uh, I tell you, I started playing golf. This is a funny story. This is. I started playing golf, and maybe the boys. I, I don't know which boys in the background, but it's probably it's it's either Brad Simon, Dave Tucker was a real influence on in me when I was Simon's, Simon's, old Simon's brother. brother. Yes, because he's a big golfer. Isn't Simon's he? brother was well, not just in the golf, even surfing. Yeah. I was very friendly with Dave, so a lot of the time, and it's quite sad really. A lot of us will miss Dave out, and Dave was always there. Mm -hmm. Dave, Dave Tucker was always there, and Dave could have been there. Anyway, my old man had some golf clubs, and we changed. And I, I held the club cack handed and the my mum's garden has got it goes out onto like a like I'm saying it's a plain field now versus but it, it went on to nothing, you could just do it. And I stood there and I whacked the crap out of this golf ball and it flew miles. And I thought it was literally I can do this. Well, I can play golf, that's a that's really easy. And that really got got us sort of hooked. It was me and Dave actually that got the got the bug. But don't get me wrong, I didn't find it easy, I practiced. I, 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 in golf, I like to practice. I like the practice, I even enjoy, or I used to enjoy the practice of playing golf, to the point that I preferred to practice sometimes and actually play. So I enjoyed that, so the grind was good. Some people don't, they just prefer but, but playing. But you did basically decide that you'd gotten good at surfing, there wasn't a huge amount of money in it, if you can get good at this, I wouldn't say, you're well, going to be quids in. I probably dreamt that I would because I was quite young then, <laughs> yeah, like we all did. 2.6, is that that? Well, I, I dreamt that I, I was going to be a pro surfer, like, and earn three quid a day, like. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, uh, no, I, I But just... you did win stuff at golf and... No, I played OK. Yeah. I played pretty good. I mean, there's some really good people that play golf, and, and I practised a lot. My biggest achievement, probably, is my first handicap was nine. So I went in as a single-figure handicap, which, if you ask people, that is a pretty good... And that isn't me saying that. That is on record as I went in at nine. So I went in pretty early, but that was through practising. Yeah. You know, when I couldn't join the club, because golf clubs are quite hard to join then, yeah. and when I couldn't join, I, I, I would just practise it, just under the golf balls. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed but it. It, did, it was. I, I, I've said this figure a few times. I feel like I'm on news night here. Yeah. I'm trying to get. No, no, it <laughs> trying is. Trying to get rid I of did. this politician. Uh, uh, my lowest point... handicap cap was two point two point six. I think it was two point six is... was my lowest. I mean, theoretically, you're, you're good to go you, in a you in a major. You couldn't now because they've got better over the years. But at that point, I could have turned pro. Yeah. You had to be below three, and you could go pro. I'm not saying you'd earn any money. But you could go on the little tours and you could turn up and you could whack a few golf balls and you could try and get in the open if you could do, you know, qualify yeah. miles away. And go, going round a golf course with you is uh, one of life's great pleasures, I have to say, because just watching how obsessed somebody can be with all the sort of nuances and details of golf, and you often tell me that you see these kind of crossovers with surfing. Yeah, I, I think all... I, I like to think all stuff does to a degree. that With... Um, with golf, one of the things with golf is, is the, the competitive side of it, I think. The fact that it, I, I think that's a crossover with sport. And also how calm you've got to be. There's not many sports you can't get angry with. Yeah. What I mean by that is you can't just walk up and go, I hit a bad shot and whack the crap out of it and it's gone somewhere because that's it, your round's finished. You've got to always be on it, haven't you? Always be calm and focused and, you're saying as well and that, going for the next shot. That like surfing... You can hit a dream shot, like your best wave ever, but then the next day there'll be a tiny bit more next dew on day, the grass, or the wind yeah. will be slightly different, and that same shot is never ever going to be. Yeah, no. It, although you play the same course, it is different all the time. You know, George will tell you that he plays, and everyone is different. One day you shoot, you know, you think you've, you think you are going pro. Next day you think, Christ Almighty, I'd be lucky to. I'd, I'd be like a golf ball. It, it is incredible how much it changes. But yeah, I, I think all sports. So I mean, Kelly Slater plays golf, doesn't he? And, and a load of the guys play golf. I mean, it is one of those things that is that I think it's because of 
I think it's because every shot is so intense, you know, everyone is so important. There's no, there's no love. And there's games within games, there's putting, isn't there? There's putting stuff. You know, I know Kelly Slater is a, is a big sort of one that, that works it through and stuff. And also body movement. Cause, yeah, that rotation. Because a lot of people don't get that. But if you look at the way a golfer hits a ball, especially nowadays, and they've all worked it out, it is the way you would cut back, the way you would do a re-entry, the way you use your body to, to get the best power out of that manoeuvre. And then there's this mantra that you used to say to us a lot, and then... Uh... In the end, it was quite effective in certain times within surfing, where you'd say that you know in golf, you just you know anyone can have three, four consecutive shots that are as good as the top guys. Anyone can put one hole together, or you can put one yeah. shot together. I should stop. You, you you tell us the theory. Well, the thing is, I could actually beat on I'm not on a day. I, I probably couldn't nowadays, but on, on my day, I could probably beat Tiger Woods on a hole. Yeah. So I could theoretically beat Tiger Woods on a hole, but I wouldn't beat him all the way around. And and that that is a real thing for, for even when you surf, it is possible in a heat to surf three good ways. And your good ways will beat a very good surfer because he may not catch those three good ways. So as long as you put your three good ways together, you're in with a chance of beating most people. But then the top guys are the ones that put the together, top guys, they put together 18 holes. The, guy, or... the top guys put it always together. I mean, a lot of them, it is changing a little bit now, but most of them will play like 80%. I only need to do 80% and, and then I do it. A little bit like, I suppose, you know, as I said, as I bring it back to, you know, when you're in the final, you let loose because you've made the final. It's a bit like I'll only hit my driver my full distance and pull everything out of the bag when I need to do it. And I don't need to do it on that first hole, do I? I need to get round until I meet the 18th and then I can let, let go and, and thoroughly enjoy it. It is a good game mind for, for mindset, really. And also you compete a lot in golf. You compete even with your mates. Like if you go out, you're always competing. So you're always, you know, closer to the hole. Uh, five quid on this or I bet you, you know, the next coffee we make is is that so you're always competing we're in surfing i know you've got people and we didn't do this to be honest we didn't do we we didn't do this so we weren't as competitive as some of them are now the only thing we did that i reckon was really good as a team and this is all of us from dave simon Brown, we would stand on the beach and we'd tell the guys where the waves are going mm -hmm. we'd stand on the beach and we'd point and go set coming left, set coming right, set coming in the middle, and we'd sort of help them out. I can remember doing that. So we'd be down the beach and, and, and we'd try and get, get the guys through the heat and, and through whatever. You know, so we'd all do that. Where nobody seems to do that now. I mean obviously somebody does somewhere and maybe I mean they've probably got microphones now, they they, they do it, you know. So going back to the scope story as it were, mm. would, would it be fair to say that whereas before the um, the problems that you found out about with your, with your kidneys, uh, whereas before that surfing and golf perhaps enjoyed an equal share of your time, that after that golf began to take the lion's share? Um, probably because, I don't know, I could say that I didn't... I lost a little bit of the, the, the buzz for surfing, to be honest with you. Yeah, I lost a bit of the buzz, and as I got better at golf, that became, you know, you'd compete on the weekend, and, and the... The problem you got when you surf, uh, and it's probably the only time I have it, is FOMO. Yeah. It's terrible in surfing, out. isn't it? Yeah. It's terrible. It's surf guilt. <laughs> surf guilt. It's, a, it's a terrible thing to do. Like even if I sat here and I said, oh, I think it's three foot over a scare today, you guys would be sitting here thinking, is it? Yeah, is it? It's you not three foot of a skin, is it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's that it's that twitch, and if someone goes, I mean, even when I was, you, you know, even if I, well, not even when I was surfing, even when I was older, and I was surfing, and someone would go and surf the S, and I was in rest bay, I'd be worried the S was really yeah. good. And the problem you get is, which I have tried to instill in George, you've got to enjoy where you are. Just enjoy where you are, because you end up surfing crap everywhere. Because <laughs> yeah. Aspie's crap, rest you've made crap, because you think Aspie's better. <laughs> you may as well just go, ju just enjoy where you are and get on with the job. 
rather than... Uh, you, you, you brought George into the conversation here then. Your, your son George is here. At some point we're going to try and see if we can drag him in and see we, we, we maybe we can get a little heckle out of him or something. <laughs> some of the bits of advice you've given George over the oh, years. Oh, no. Now, these are legendary, right? Uh, and, and, you know, going around a golf course with you and George, you're lecturing him, you're lecturing me the whole way round. <laughs> Uh, George, you probably remember that time when he took us around watching the Open. At, oh, know, that was and, good, though, yeah. that was, wasn't it? It was great. And you were Every single sh- shot, you were going, right, look at this, what this guy's doing here, look what he's doing here, look, there's the caddy with the notebook. You were and loving then, life then. I was loving it. The, but then you stop us off by the driving range and you go, hey, George, you know, look, you boys will like this one, look at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a golfer practising in the That was good, range. watching the Co- golf swing. And the golfer practising in the driving range is called Willie Wood. You're like, yep, yeah, Willie Wood, Willie Wood. Anyway, carry on, and carry on, <laughs> and all these serious stories. <laughs> Uh, I remember the first time I ever played with you. You were, um, you, you went to tell me something about my stroke. I said, "Scope, no, just let me hit one shot, and you can tell me whatever you want afterwards." You're all right, fine, fine, fine. So I hit the ball, topped it totally, travelled about a meter, and, and you must have waited like a decade to say this. <laughs> you said, I'll tell you exactly what you're doing wrong. You're standing too close to the ball after you hit it. <laughs> <laughs> But the most famous of all of these that's continued to do the rounds is the famous one pound sixty a meter quote. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to tell it's us that? Funny that is. It's that's really funny. You, it, Tom always remembers this. I can remember him bringing. I sort of said it really flippantly. It just like came out. We were at the Welsh. Uh, we're at the that's Welsh, it, and George <laughs> was. Uh, Here uh, comes the heckles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, it still hurts. George was surfing it. the heat. Funny, it was by the. It's, it's a pipe that comes out, isn't it? There's a right pipe that comes pipe, out. Yeah, yeah. And it was quite high tide, and he, he, he was in one of his heats. And I think it cost what? Fourth like thing, a, it was probably the under 10s or something. It was like a fiver <laughs> to enter, or a ten well, to well, enter. 20 quid, I think. It was a tenner to enter. So I'm sitting on the beach watching him, and he must have gone on the <laughs> whole. In the whole heat, he must have stood up and gone about. Four metres. <laughs> if that, the board is almost longer than he travelled along the way. <laughs> and, and I thought, when he came out, I said, Jesus Christ, George, that cost me about £1.60 a bloody for the heat, a metre, that did. And Tom happened to be there, and he thought it was really funny. Yeah. Where I was just flipping, it was just a flip and I've never, never forgot, I, I took George on his first ever trip away, you know, his first ever trip without his dad, I took him to Pembroke. Oh, yeah. A fiver he had. For lunch, yeah. we thought, well, oh, George, he's giving you a fiver for lunch, you know, you know, no, you know. Petrol money, that was well, that was it, you know, you know the price of these burger vans, don't yeah. pay, right? I was going to die, I think I had to top him up with a yeah, couple of quid myself, and I dropped him back off, and you said, you've given him that petrol money now, George, <laughs> <laughs> I think he was said to Ben Crown, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, spent, spent his petrol money on lunch. <laughs> no, it was funny, that was, wasn't it? It, it is, it is amazing how we want, we, we try and sort of, oh, but you can't, you know, as a dad, you you obviously want your son to do as well as he can, but you can only do so much, can't you? You know, you can only do that anyway. Hey, you've, no. you've done well. He's a he's a smashing kid, and he's uh, you know in in all ways, and he's got a good couple of big surf titles. Yeah, to do and, as he, well, so. and he can grow air, can't he? That's and, amazing. And he thinks he thinks he surfs better than you. Farmer. Is this true? He thinks he he's, surfs better than me. I've never. Seen do you know? I think I think. Um, You're stirring the pot. Yeah, I I think. Do you know something? If you put us, if you actually, we, we've had this discussion, but I always think that if if I looked at the guys now, the the surfers around Portugal, I probably think they they would be they would be better than me. But I would like to think that if I had their equipment and I was them, I would be better. Well, we than had that conversation. But, but I the, think the comparison that people often make about the seventies. Uh, Welsh rugby fifteen yeah. against the current one. No, and it obviously is, yeah. the current one would beat them. However, given the opportunities and the training and yeah. the nutrition and goodness knows what, would that seventy squad hold up yeah. to them? Probably, they probably would. They, they would. I, I would like to think that the people around here are better than we are. I think, but surfing for whatever reason, and I don't know why, has sort of moved ahead of a lot of people in Wales. And, and I don't know why that is, you know, I'm not, I can't solve that problem. But it, it moved on, you know, from when we were there. I don't think if, I don't think if, if, you know, I can only speak for myself, but I don't think if I was around now, I would be British champion. Because I think the people elsewhere are better than, they've moved on. Are you with me? As I said before, and I'll come back to it, we were in a great era 
for Welsh surfing. And we had great people behind us, PJ, you know, your father as well, you know, all of those people were good in the, in uh, around here. And we had that. And I don't know why it left. I, you know, I sometimes put it down to boards, but, uh, but who, who am I to say that? But I'm just saying that uh, I look and I think I wouldn't have made the difference. I don't think I would have been sort of, you know, you wouldn't have come round here and gone, oh, God, you're British champion. You know, I, I don't think I would have been. And we lived in a good era. I tell you why as well, is we flew to uh, Australia on British Airways and we paid, like, 50 quid or something. You know, we didn't, it was all paid for. We had wetsuits and we had tracksuits. It was, it was banging. It was really good. Hi, it's producer Dodd here. You don't hear from me very often. Cracking job by Rob and Tom there as usual. However, as Tom said in the intro, Mark's life story is just too interesting to be contained to a single episode. As such, we split this one in two and you can get the conclusion to Mark's story at the usual time next Monday morning. And as you've heard, you can never have too much Mark Schofield. <laughs>